Hello everyone and welcome to a new video. Today I'm getting back to the Sewing Through the Decades series and moving on to the latter half of the 20th century and into the 1960s. If you're unfamiliar with this series, it's where I follow original vintage sewing patterns from every decade of the 20th century and share the process with all of you. I will have a playlist with all of the previous videos in this series linked down below. But as I said, today we are taking on the 60s. And a lot of 60s designs look very similar to styles from the 50s. Full skirts were still in fashion for the first half, as were more fitted wiggle dress styles. But I wanted something very different from the pieces I attempted for the 50s, yet not quite the shapeless style that became so popular in the 60s. So I picked a happy medium, or at least I think I did. And this is a jumper dress pattern by McCall. Specifically pattern number 7419, which was patented in 1964. This pattern has 17 pieces and three different views, and today I'll be making two of these views, the jumper dress and the blouse. The blouse is made from a cherry printed quilting cotton you may recognize from a previous fabric haul, and it was the first garment I got started on. And starting involved cutting the pattern out, which took a while given the quantity of pieces. In addition to cutting all the blouse pieces from the cotton, I also cut out the facings for the jumper, since the jumper fabric was thicker and not as suitable for lining. Unlike a lot of patterns in this series, this one is in my size, so it didn't need alterations. But you might notice me adding seam allowance at points, and that's how I could sew certain seams as French seams to reduce fraying and increase the lifetime of this garment. And for anyone horrified about me using the original tissue paper, up until the 80s patterns were sold in individual sizes. For example, this pattern is a size 16 for a 36 inch bust, which means you weren't reducing the usability of a pattern by cutting it out. Also, this pattern was very well loved or not very loved, depending on how you look at it. It was torn and had been abused by a tracing wheel, so I didn't feel too bad about using it. After cutting everything out, I began transferring markings from the pattern onto my fabric, like the button placement, center front point, and the dart. These darts are pretty interesting. They are huge and span diagonally from the center of the chest to the natural waistline, giving the garment a unique silhouette. Definitely not a placement I would usually draft a dart to be, but it did the job. And before sewing the darts, I ironed a strip of interfacing into the very front of the bodice. The pattern said to base the interfacing in place, but I prefer iron in interfacings, so that wasn't necessary. Then I stay stitched around the neckline of the front panels, which I actually should have done before marking the pieces or adding interfacing. This stitching prevents the edges from warping and stretching, so it should be done before the pieces have been handled at all. And now I went ahead and pinned the darts, making sure my pins went through the markings on both layers. This ensures that they line up perfectly. And now I'm repeating those steps on the back panels, though the dart is positioned a little bit more normally. However, marking this dart sure made me miss perforated patterns. That would have made this so much easier. I really hate double-ended dart, especially on densely printed fabrics where it's hard to see your markings. And these were also rounded darts, so multiple points had to be marked and followed. But I did manage, and then all the darts could be sewn. These were all ironed according to the pattern. For example, it specified folding the darts towards the back of the bodice and ironing the bust darts down. Then I pinned up the shoulder seams with the wrong sides of the garment facing each other. These were sewn with a half inch allowance, then the seam allowance was trimmed down to a quarter inch, the seam was ironed open and pinned with the right sides facing each other. It was sewn once again, creating a French seam that won't fray. It gave that an iron as well, then pinned the side seams at the bodice and stitched them in the same manner. Their actual instructions for this were seam back to front at shoulders and sides. Pretty basic. And actually, at this point, we are still on step one. This pattern is broken up weirdly, so they can claim it's only seven steps, but each of those steps has a half dozen tasks within them. 
Step two is called collar and begins with interfacing being basted into the wrong side of one collar section. But once again, I used fusible interfacing. Though I didn't film myself ironing it on for some reason that probably involves laziness. Then it says, face collar right sides together, stitch along unnotched edges, turn right side out, baste close to seamed edges, press, baste draw edges together. So I'm pinning the layers together, then sewing along the outer edges. The corners were clipped, then I turned it right side out and used a tailor's block to thoroughly press the points and iron the seams before creasing the collar on the seam line and ironing it flat. I bought this for historical tailoring projects, but it has come in handy for projects like this too, where I want a sharper finish. Since this was so thoroughly ironed, I didn't think basting was necessary. So I jumped straight into the next step within step two, which is baste collar to neck edge of blouse, right sides up matching notches, collar circle to shoulder seams and front ends of collar to center front markings on dress. Which I kind of followed. I matched up the notches and pinned the collar on. And then I did a little something called machine basting, which is like normal basting, but basically just sewing in general because it lacks the temporary and delicate nature that basting provides. But it's much faster. <laughs> and it worked just fine in this case. And now onto step three, which involves the facing. For this, they say, the back neck facing is seamed to the front facings at shoulders, seam neck facing to side edges of front facings, which are in one with the fronts, which is a complicated way to say that the front of the bodice forms part of the facing. So I sewed the back neck facing on, then iron the seam allowances open. And I carried that ironing so the frontmost edge of the bodice was turned inward by a half inch. Now they say, fold each front on the facing line, right sides together, stitch facing to neck of dress, trim seam, clip curve, and front corners. The front facing line indicates where the front of the bodice is turned inward to form the facing. And once you figure that out, it's pretty straightforward. After clipping the corners, it instructs me to understitch the facing. Their exact words are, understitch neck seam to keep facing from rolling up as follows. Lift facing, turn seam allowances toward facing, then top stitch facing close to seam through the seam allowances ending two inches from the corners. Turn facing to inside again, turning under each front on facing line and baste close to neck edge, allowing collar extend. Tack inner edge of facing to shoulder seam of blouse. I'm really not sure what benefit basting would have here, so I stuck to pinning the facing inward all the way around. Then I opted to completely sew the facing down since I find floppy facings really annoying. I just did this with whip stitches and it didn't take very long at all. And now step four, sleeves. The first order of business with these is creating the opening. The instructions for this are mark slash position at lower edge of sleeve using thread for marking or tracing wheel. Do not cut, mark slash position on sleeve facing. Turn under one quarter inch of unnotched edges of facing and edge stitch. Pleating fullness at corners, place slash marking of facing over slash marking on sleeve. Right sides together. Stitch around slash marking as indicated on pattern slash midway between stitching. Turn facing to inside base close to seam edges, slip stitch inner edges of facing flat to sleeve. Now I actually only marked the slash point on the facings, then lined them up with the notches on the bottom edge of the sleeves. I followed the marked lines, then clipped the slash open and gave it a really thorough iron. I also folded the edges of the facing inward at this point and pinned them down. So I guess the only instruction I did follow was slip stitching the facings flat to the sleeves, which you can see me doing here. Despite not quite following their method, we ended up with the exact same result. And to be honest, this whole method of slashing sleeves in general feels very odd to me. I usually leave openings in the side seam of sleeves, but I kind of like it. I think I'll incorporate it into my designs more often. Now I'm pinning, then sewing and ironing the sleeve seam. And it's time for the cuffs. The instructions for these were fold sleeve band on line indicated, right sides together, stitch ends and across top to circle, trim end seams and turn right side out, baste or press 
a long fold edge and ends. So I'm folding the band in half and pinning, then sewing the ends. The corners were clipped, then the cuffs were turned right side out and ironed until they looked nice and sharp. Now that the cuffs were kind of done, I used them as a guide for the length to gather the sleeves down to. And once the edge of the sleeve matched the length of the cuff, I tied off my thread. Then I also gathered down the top of the sleeves, however this time I didn't tie off the thread. Instead I left a tail of 10 or so inches, so I could adjust the density of the gathers when setting it in the arm side. Now I'm pinning one layer of the cuff to the sleeve with the right sides facing each other. Then they are sewn together with a half inch allowance. Now the other edge of the cuff is turned inward by a half inch and pinned down so it covers the raw inner edges. And this gets whip stitched down to avoid visible stitching. Now these sleeves can be pinned on, I'm matching the underarm seams and notches first, then adjusting the gathers in the head of the sleeve until it fits nicely, and pinning the top portion in place. I'd read you their instructions for this step, but it's basically three paragraphs of text saying what I just said in two sentences. These were sewn on, then ironed, and I might go back and bind them later on, but I haven't gotten to it yet. And now for the hem. They have a few different options, but I went for the one involving binding. They say, stitch one edge of seam binding along edge, right sides up, turning under blouse 5 eighths of an inch from cut edge and baste close to fold edge, blind hem free edge of binding to blouse. I find it so odd how anytime you fold in an edge, they immediately want you to baste across that fold. I haven't seen that in any other patterns and I really don't see how it would be helpful. So here I'm sewing the binding on, then ironing it inward by 5 eighths of an inch. And once again, I'm not basting. That's because the ironing does such a good job of temporarily securing it. And now I'm sewing the binding down by hand using slip stitches. But the blouse still isn't done. It needs closures and ties. The ties consist of two pieces, the shorter left tie and the longer right tie. These pieces are folded in half lengthwise with the right sides facing each other, then stitched all the way around, except for a small opening on one long edge, which allows the ties to be turned right side out. I clip the corners before turning them right side out so they'd look nice and sharp. Then I used a pencil to aid in the point making process and the ties were ironed. And the opening was slip stitched shut. Now on to closures. They have detailed instructions for hand sewing buttonholes, but they also mention the possibility of using a machine attachment, so I opted for that. There are buttonholes at the top of each tie, at each cuff, and down the front of the blouse. And I'm stitching each of these buttonholes by machine twice to make sure they are nice and dense. Though I did get a sewing machine that allows for button attachment recently, so I might be using a different method in future videos. Now I'm cutting open all the buttonholes with a seam ripper and scissors. And these are the buttons I'll be using. They are all the same color, but they are different sizes and styles. The smallest ones are positioned below the collar, and these buttons are how the ties attach and can be removed. Since the buttons are hidden by the collar, that means they can be worn without the ties without anyone noticing. larger, more decorative buttons run down the front of the blouse. And just above the last button, the natural waistline, there's a snap to prevent anything from coming undone. And I guess I don't have footage of it, but smaller green buttons were stitched onto each cuff to keep them closed. And that finished off the blouse. 
Now onto the jumper dress. Much like with the blouse, the first step was cutting this out, except this time around I'm using an apparel flannel in dark red. And once again I'm leaving extra allowance for French seams. Then I'm transferring the dart placement onto the fabric. The darts are pinned, then sewn, then ironed. I'm also stay stitching around the neckline just like I did with the blouse. And pinning then sewing up the shoulder seams. But unlike the blouse, this jumper doesn't have sleeves or collar, which means those edges are finished with cotton facings. So here I'm notching those facings, then pinning and sewing them together. These facings are for the arm opening, and these are for the neck facing. The next step is facing the neck edge, and this is surprisingly tricky. Let me read you their instructions. Pin facing to neck edge of jumper, right sides together. Base together along neck edge, turning up 5 eighths of an inch on left back edge of jumper over facing and based. Stitch as basted. The whole turning the back edge to cover the facing is what confused me, but I got it to work and then I sewed the facing on. Also, I'm not sure where the footage went, but I ironed all the edges of the facing inward by a quarter inch before sewing it on. I clipped the point of the jumper, then folded the facing outward. This was understitched just like the facing on the bodice, and their explanation is identical too. Except for the fact that the understitching ends 2 inches away from the back edge this time. And then I turned the facing inside and ironed it. This time they instruct you to tack the entire edge of the facing down, so I did just that with whip stitches. Except once again, I'm leaving the back two inches of the facing free. It'll be sewn down after adding the closures. Speaking of closures, this closes with a 22 inch zipper down the back. So I'm sewing up the remaining portion of the back seam by machine, then ironing it open. And now they say to turn under seam allowance on right edge back opening from a scant 1 8 of an inch outside the seam line at lower end of opening to 5 8 of an inch at neck seam and baste. Leave neck facing free. Turn under full 5 8 of an inch seam allowance on left edge of back opening from neck seam to lower edge of opening and baste, leaving neck facing free. Place right edge of opening tape of a closed zipper right sides up, having pull tab of zipper down about half inch below low neck seam and edge of fabric close to zipper teeth. Pin and baste turning down tape of zipper at top. Edge stitch using a zipper foot on the machine. So the next step is lap edge of opening over right so that zipper is hidden and pin turning down tape of zipper at top. Baste across lower end of zipper and up length about 3 eighths of an inch from edge. Stitch as basted. Now obviously I didn't baste this but I did thoroughly pin it. Now it says turn in and hand back edges of neck facing along zipper tapes, which was easy enough. And it also instructed me to sook a hook and a bar on. Now as a side note, you might notice the zipper changed colors. I actually want to re-sew it because the stitching wasn't super even, and in the process I seam ripped through the zipper tape, rendering it unusable. So it now has a bright pink zipper instead, but you really can't tell when it's closed. With the closures flawlessly accomplished, I could move on to step four, which is just sewing the side seams. And I stitched these as French seams so the seam was sewn with the wrong sides facing each other, then trimmed, ironed, and sewn again with the right sides facing each other. But I didn't film this whole process since I showed it earlier in the video. 
And now for facing the armholes. I already seamed these together, so the next step was finishing the outer edges. They instructed me to overcast these edges, but I just ironed them inward instead, since that gives a cleaner finish. I lined the seams of the facing up with the seams of the jumper, then pinned them on. The facings were stitched on with a half inch allowance. Then the edges were notched and the facings were turned inside and ironed into position. Like with the neck facing, the outer edges were slip stitched to the jumper. Now I'm using some vintage hem binding. Look at that retro font, how very appropriate for a 60s dress. And once again, following their hemming instructions, which involved top stitching binding to the right side, then turning it inward by an even width and slip stitching it down. Their instructions also specified to hang the garment for several days prior to hemming, since the side seams are cut on the bias and will likely warp slightly. I did that off camera and trimmed the hem to an even length before hemming. And then the hem was ironed and my ensemble was done. I really like how this turned out. This was actually my second attempt following this pattern, since my first attempt was plagued by a bad fabric choice. So I was not feeling enthusiastic or hopeful about this project at all. But I think the finished pieces are really cute together and cute as separates too. And I've gotten a good bit of wear out of these two pieces in the past weeks. So I'm really glad I reattempted this and I'm glad that I got to share it with you. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this video, then giving it a like and a comment really helps me out. And if you'd like to see me attempt the 70s and remaining decades of the 20th century, then you should subscribe. Thanks again for watching and I shall talk to all of you very soon.